The most difficult thing I've had to do in my life is probably run for office. Um, it's not something that I was trained to do. Um, I studied to be an accountant, um, worked for a big eight accounting firm. And when you do accounting, you sit at a desk and you right, work with numbers all day long, kind of in your office by yourself. Eventually, I think after you've been around a little while and you see who the elected officials are, you start thinking maybe you could do a better job. Um, so I like to help people every day. I like to level the playing field. Uh, this is my passion and my calling in life, and uh, I'm very just honored to be able to be here. This is my fourth elected position. Uh, I've been on the ballot 19 times. I haven't lost yet, um, but I don't take anything for granted. Uh, I feel like I work harder than everybody else because I uh, don't want to go back and do taxes. Uh, I don't want my parents to say, I told you so. Um, and, you know, I just, um, you know, I'm just blessed and excited every day to wake up and do what I do. So thanks again for coming in to see us at Cal Matters and talking to all the voters out there who are wondering about what to do in this particular race. Um, and we'll just get started. We have a lot of questions to get through, so we're just going to go ahead and get started. And the reporters will introduce themselves as they go. OK. Hi, I'm Samia Kamal. I'm a reporter on our politics team. And we thought we would kick off with some kind of more personal questions. So um, starting off, what do you think most people get wrong about California? Uh, I, I would say that everybody's leaving California in droves. Um, that's kind of the perception that um, you hear a lot. What else do they get wrong? I think most people love California when they come to visit. Uh, lots of, you know, students um, overseas like to come to California. It's beautiful if you drive around California. Uh, you can see the beauty just in a couple of hour drive. Um, there's a lot of uh, diversity here, which is what we pride ourselves on as the fifth largest economy. And I think that's what the credit rating agencies also give us credit for is our great diversity, our entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so I think just that first thing is, is what I think we get a bad rap. And what is the most difficult thing you've had to do in your life? Most difficult thing I've had to do in my life is probably run for office. Um, it's not something that I was trained to do. Um, I studied to be an accountant, um, worked for a big eight accounting firm. And when you do accounting, you sit at a desk and you right, work with numbers all day long, kind of in your office by yourself. And so when I first started in public service speaking in public, uh, without notes uh, was very, very scary. So I did, you know, have to write everything out and speak with notes. And now after 20 years, uh, I'm very comfortable without notes because I can't really go back and forth. My eyesight is not as good uh, these days. So I need to wear my, uh, uh, my cheaters. So I think that was the hardest, um, just being out there in public, speaking. Um, and then as I have evolved over the last 20 years, uh, being able to take credit for the things that I've done. Um, you know, I think as a, a female, as an Asian, uh, we weren't brought up to boast uh, or take credit or, you know, beat our chest. And so we were really taught to work hard, um, you know, listen, learn, and only speak when you have something to say, basically. Well, I'm curious. Uh, so you, you said you weren't trained, you know, in this, but what made you decide to go into public service? Yeah, so I, um, when I left the big eight accounting firms, I started my own practice and I became president of a small business association. And that was the first time that I got involved in politics, uh, going down to San Francisco City Hall, Sacramento to testify on bills. Uh, I was elected delegate to the 1995 White House Conference on Small Business. And I started to see, you know, the people that are actually uh, out there representing. At elected office, there were not a lot of women. Uh, not a lot of people of color. And, um, you know, I was with a group of uh, people who wanted to be at the table instead of complaining, 
to proactively do something, whether it's you know register to vote, get involved in electing candidates, sit on boards and commissions, and eventually, I think after you've been around a little while and you see who the elected officials are, you start thinking maybe you could do a better job. Um, so I like to help people every day. I like to level the playing field. Uh, this is my passion and my calling in life, and uh, I'm very just honored to be able to be here. This is my fourth elected position. Uh, I've been on the ballot 19 times. I haven't lost yet, um, but I don't take anything for granted. Uh, I feel like I work harder than everybody else because I uh, don't want to go back and do taxes. Uh, I don't want my parents to say, I told you so. Um, and, you know, I just, um, you know, I'm just blessed and excited every day to wake up and do what I do. Obviously, you've been on this pretty <clears throat> steady rise through California politics, and I think you have expressed some interest in the past in running for governor as a next step. Is that still something that you're considering for 2026? Well, I don't take any race for granted, so we're just working really hard uh, to see how I do in November, and we will see after then. Uh, 2026 is four years away, and as all of you know, four years is a long time. Uh, in politics. Things change, situations change, people change, um, so we, we'll just have to see after this election. That's not a no. It's not a no. Okay. Uh, well, launching into, I think, some questions about the budget and the economy, um, which areas of the state budget would you focus on to make sure that spending is effective? Uh, well, every day um, in my office at 8 o'clock, we have a standing a call since the pandemic happened uh, with my cash management, investments, and public finance divisions. So for me, it's all about the cash coming in, right? Are we meeting our budget expectations? Um, if not, how are we proactively planning, um, you know, to uh, pivot in case the governor, um, you know, um, makes different allocations uh, in the budget? How it affects my office? and also how we invest, right? As inflation, interest rates are, are, are rising, inflation is rising, um, you know, certain types of you know, commercial paper uh, may be affected, so we have to think about the short-term horizon, three months, six months, even you know, up to a year. Um, so everything is pretty much uh, fiscal, whether we're gonna issue bonds on time, you know, what the bonds are for, are they gonna sell? Um, you know, out on the market, or are they going to be popular? And so I'm always worried about the financial health of our state. Um, I guess, are there specific areas like housing? Yes, so, um, yes, so housing is definitely uh, one of the main priorities for me after my constitutional functions of uh, managing, investing, and, and issuing bonds. Um, so housing, I chair SIDLAC and TCAC, uh, California Debt Limit Allocation Committee as well as the California Tax Credit um, Allocation Committee that allocates the bonds and the tax credits that goes to subsidize affordable housing. So uh, for the past uh, three uh, years, I have been actively chairing that committee, so actively involved in all of the reforms, the regulation changes, uh, the deadlines uh, that are out there. So I'm very proud to say that I think we have uh, approved more uh, new construction applications than ever before, and that's thanks to Governor Newsom allocating $500 million in state low-income housing tax credits for now his fourth fiscal year. We also had two rounds of disaster credits. That's 9% disaster credits uh, from the federal government to rebuild faster in fire-devastated regions. So we've had a lot of uh, external support, which means that all of our um, you know, bonds and tax credits are competitive. So we have sometimes up to three times the capacity um, for the applications, but a lot of the projects that have been on the shelf for many, many years now because of this extra help has been able to you know, come off the shelf and we've been able to allocate uh, across the state. And we've been very deliberate in how we allocate the pools as well as the geographic regions so that not all of the resources are centered either in the Bay Area or Los Angeles. So I'm very proud of that. Um, we also uh, streamlined a lot of processes with my uh, two agencies, uh, as well as the California Housing Finance Agency. So the four agencies, my two agencies, CalHFA and 
California Housing and Community Development have worked really uh, hard uh, to be in, um, you know, line step with each other so that we are aligning uh, definitions, uh, deadlines, uh, funding sources so that we can try to make this process uh, more efficient. We also, for the first time, sold bonds to build student housing on a community college site, uh, and that was the Santa Rosa Community College. We've never done that before in the state, and that is an area where developers don't want to go because of the uh, population at community colleges. They are not stable, consistent uh, rent payers, and so we have gotten into that, um, that space, and it's very successful, and we're looking to build more student and teacher housing, especially on community college sites. Um, we also oversaw the RFP for the um, new shared appreciation uh, program. Um, California Forward won the RFP. It was uh, strongly supported by Tony Atkins as well as Bob Hertzberg, and that's the Dream for All program. And Governor Newsom put $500 million into this program so that we can assist with down payment assistance for low income as well as middle income um, workers that can't afford to save that 20%. So, um, CalHFA is working on the guidelines and uh, rolling out the program, but we are working very closely with them to make sure that uh, we are helping the people that need it most so that we can keep the workforce that we need here in the state of California. So those are just a couple of the programs, but housing, housing, housing. So um, as you know, you know, the governor <laughs> signed the latest round of um, housing, uh, affordable housing bills earlier today. Um, is there anything that the governor and the legislature aren't doing now that they should be doing or you would urge them to do to um, ease the affordable housing shortage? Uh, well, I, I came from the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Um, that was my first election, so I am very pro-local control because I believe that local government, uh, local elected officials, know and are closest to their constituents. However, because of the difficulty in building affordable housing in certain communities, the legislature has stepped up uh, to almost mandate uh, certain processes because of the difficulty that local elected officials have in uh, trying to pass sometimes you know, affordable housing, whether it's for formerly homeless, disabled, seniors. Um, there's always people that don't want it or don't want it in my backyard, right? And then, um, then you have the local processes of the uh, permitting and you know all, all the building regulations that go with that. And then you have the cost of construction, um, which also plays into it. And so it is really difficult to build affordable housing. So I think the state stepping in and moving the needle, pushing uh, local communities to abide by the RENA uh, numbers or at least attempt to meet the RENA numbers, whereas, as you know, some of the local jurisdictions didn't even want to build any housing and basically snubbed their nose at the state. And so that's what's happened. Um, I think it takes a lot of burden off of the local elected officials, but it also makes it a statewide, um, you know, collaborative, more of a statewide collaborative process, which I think we need at this moment. Given your interest in in these housing issues. I did want to ask about your opposition to a bill this year, AB 2305. It would have centralized some of these uh, affordable housing funding programs that the state has. Um, you know, there's been some analysis done by the state auditor that because of this Byzantine system that we have billions of dollars in, in bonds for affordable housing have basically been lost. They haven't ever made it out the door as a result, but you expressed your opposition to this bill. You thought it wasn't the right approach. I would like to know yep. why why that was. Yeah, so, um, you know, since uh, Governor Newsom and myself, uh, we came in with that strong uh, mandate and prior priority to housing, uh, we have really worked together, the four agencies, to streamline, align, and make processes more efficient, and creating another uh, board that oversees um, the four agencies, to me, at this point, um, is bureaucratic and not needed. We are trying to roll out 
all of the tax credits and bonds as quickly as possible. And so let us do our job. Um, at some point, I understand what the motive of this board is, is to go like one time and be able to uh, apply and know whether you're gonna get the funding. And we are moving in that direction. Uh, HCD just uh, went through a supernova uh, process where they are going to um, basically allocate their six main funding sources uh, at one time, which is what is needed, right? Because HCD gets the majority of the funding and it's like putting together a puzzle piece and you never know. But HCD also doesn't have a board, a public board, whereas SIDLAC, TCAC, CALCHFA, we have public meetings, we have public board meetings, we have agendas that are posted, minutes that are posted, and so we are being held accountable to the public every day because we're reporting out. HCD, for all of the resources that they have, they don't have a public board. They don't have public meetings, um, minutes, right, where they have to meet certain goals. So this supernova is, I think, the first step, and if that doesn't work, then I think having one board where now everybody is forced to come to the table and allocate all the resources at once, I think is the next step. But right now we're still kind of getting our houses in order and trying to get everything moved out as quickly as possible, especially during the pandemic. Can you point to any specific criteria, I guess, that, that you think shows how the streamlining and, and other steps that you've already taken have improved the process without the necessity of you know, this additional? Yeah, so, um, so we have a, a one-stop application now um, with Calich FA. Uh, that had never been done before. Um, we also pre-funded Calich FA's MIP program this time in our first round versus making them go through three rounds of funding when they have their um, you know, inventory already uh, in place. Um, I combined TCAC and SIDLAC under one executive director because before having two directors was like having two hands going in different directions and now having one central director has really um, streamlined you know, personnel, how we do uh, work, obviously aligning deadlines and especially the regulation uh, process because the terminology was not um, aligned and so people that applied for the bonds had a different criteria for the tax credit. So now all of that is aligned and you can ask the affordable housing uh, developers whether uh, I am speaking truth to my word but I think they will let you know that, um, that processes are, are much, much more efficient. And I have to say during the pandemic, I still came in every month and chaired all the meeting from Sacramento, whereas everybody was, uh, was attending virtually. And that enabled us to continue to keep all of our deadlines every month, but we also had additional meetings. If we couldn't get our work done or if something wasn't agendized or something came out from the federal government that we needed to address, like we had a lot of extra meetings even during the pandemic. Um, so before we move on to the next subject, for our viewers out there who don't live in the housing world, can you just quickly go through all the agencies that you've um, sort of used the acronyms for and just explain very briefly okay. what they are? Okay, so in addition to my investments, cash management, investments, and public finance division, I also chair 13 active boards and commissions, California Debt Limit Allocation Committee is for uh, tax-exempt private activity bonds, which goes to fund and finance affordable housing as well as other type of projects like garbage, recycling, desal. Um, so that's that committee. California Tax Credit Allocation allocates the 9% and the 4% tax credits. So we get 9% from the feds, 4% from the state, and so that committee, and a lot of times affordable housing developers apply for both, and that's why it was important to align um, the two agencies. Uh, CAPFA, the California Alternative Energy and Transportation Finance Authority, uh, it is uh, a mouthful, but it basically uh, funds and finances a lot of the advanced uh, manufacturing, green technology. We offer sales tax exemptions for uh, companies that are buying expensive equipment that are cleaning and greening. 
um, you know, our state. And so they can apply to save that 10% or 11% in sales taxes. Um, California Pollution Finance Control is also another uh, clean, green uh, energy uh, type of uh, um, board. And then I oversee three savings programs, Scholarship 529 to encourage uh, kids to stay out of high student loan debt, Cal Savers for those who don't have a retirement savings plan at their office, at their workplace, and then Cal Able, um, which is for those people diagnosed with a disability before the age of 26 years old, they can now save up to $16,000 in their own name. Okay. And then I think you also mentioned HCD, which is Housing and Community Development, which among other things, administer rent relief during the pandemic. Yeah, so HCD is under the governor's shop, right? Um, and they also have a lot of different funding sources for uh, different housing programs. And then Cal HFA, California Housing Finance Authority, is also under the governor's uh, office as well. Okay. Great. Um, so switching gears slightly, uh, do you support a further increase in the state minimum wage? Um, I think at this time, um, knowing that as of January 1st, 2023, uh, it's going to go to $15.50 uh, with the COLA adjustment ongoing. Um, I support the bill as is, and let's see you know, whether we're going to get out of this pandemic um, and recover as quickly as possible. Um, but you know, clearly $15 is, is low. Uh, I think it translates to like $28,000. Uh, in income, so um, I support the bill, and, and hopefully, you know, the economy gets better and people get paid more um, as the cola increases. Um, do you feel that the state is doing enough to address growing inequality in California? We are doing the best that we can. Um, this governor and the legislature has put uh, more money into the earned income tax credit uh, for those who are low income. Um, being able to get more money back, and this is a tax credit, so they get it back regardless of whether they pay their taxes or not. Um, the governor put over a billion dollars and the legislature a billion dollars into a new Cal Kids program where every baby born after July 1st will get a seated account between $25 and $100, and that money is supposed to grow over 18 years for college education or apprenticeship programs, and for every first through 12th grader, they will get $500 in a seated account if they are eligible, meaning free and reduced lunch. So they'll get $500. If they are homeless, they'll get another $500. And if they are a foster youth, they'll get another $500. Um, so this is really you know, focused on foster youth, homeless kids that we're actually giving more money. Uh, starting next year, uh, the governor and the legislature are also going to have free preschool for all four-year-olds. Um, because we know people uh, that need to work to households, they need some place um, you know, to care for their kids and preschool is very, very expensive uh, these days. And so they are doubling down on making free preschool for all uh, four-year-olds. So programs like this, I mean, there's just you know, a lot in the budget that was done with the surplus as well as with the 27 billion that we got from the federal government for COVID relief. I mean, it really went to rent relief, it went to restaurant revitalization. Right now we're uh, giving grants for performing arts organizations that were closed during the pandemic. Um, and so I, I just see this state as, as very uh, generous and very mindful of who is still struggling here. Is there anything that you think the state should be doing that it's not doing right now? state not doing. Uh, yes, um, so I spend a lot of time in my Asian community and we're not monolithic. Uh, we have Cambodian, Thai, Hmong, uh, Burmese, you know, Vietnamese, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and most of them did not get any help during the pandemic because number one, English may not be their first language. Number two, people who are doing the outreach are not doing it in other languages. Number three, there's sometimes a lack of trust 
up that, you know, what is government doing? Are they, you know, getting information from me? And sometimes, um, you know, their finances are just not as, as strong and stable and they don't have those strong working relationships with their banks and financial institutions. So those people are still struggling. Every time I go to those communities, they always ask, is there more money? Because, you know, I wasn't open, you know, I'm an import exporter, I'm a restaurant owner, uh, I'm, I'm a dance company, I'm a church. Um, so many people are still struggling that, you know, English is not their first language. And um, do you support a guaranteed basic income? Uh, I voted uh, on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. I am a DCCC member, and so I did vote for that minimum basic income initiative uh, that is being proposed that will be funded by Amazon. Um, so in many of his vetoes, Governor Newsom cited, you know, declining tax revenues and um, warning about a possible economic downturn. Do you believe that a recession is coming and is the state prepared or should it be doing anything more? Uh, yeah, so, so this quarter was the first uh, down, um, da down cycle in, in growth and normally a recession is defined as two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. So we've had one pretty significant quarter this year. Let's see what happens uh, next quarter. Um, so that's where I think the governor is, um, is talking about. And I believe we are about four billion under uh, projections uh, based on our revenues right now. So you never know during the pandemic, who knew whether we were, you know, we thought we were preparing for like a $40 billion deficit and lo and behold, we had a $40 billion surplus. And then the next year, $94 billion surplus. So, Let's hope that uh, our high net worth individual uh, taxpayers stay here in the state of California. Um, you know, I think uh, stock capital gain sales has slowed down, which is, um, was a major component uh, during the last two years, as well as companies that have gone public, stock options, stock bonuses, companies were still, um, you know, st still engaging in, in those uh, economic, um, you know, boons to the state of California. But high inflation, obviously, you know, is, is impacting a lot of the activity and we are seeing a slowdown right now. You said something in that last answer that was uh, interesting to me about hoping that the high earners who pay, obviously, a disproportionate amount of income taxes in the state stay here. Are you one of those people who's worried that California is driving away those, those wealthiest residents, those highest? taxpayers, and, and if so, what do you think the state should be doing to try and keep them here? Yeah, I, I am. Um, you know, the top 1% pay or contribute about 49% uh, of our state's general fund. That's a lot, right? We are highly dependent on high net worth individuals. So, you know, keeping them here, I think as long as we are seen as business friendly, um, we do have a couple of programs I can talk to you, uh, uh, talk a little bit more about that are trying to incentivize and, uh, you know, bring businesses in. Um, people want to live here in California. You know, they don't mind paying a little sunshine tax, but if they feel like they're being demonized every day uh, and not, right, respected, uh, treated with respect like everybody else wants to be treated, I think that's where um, we start seeing high net worth individuals uh, looking to leave the state. And, and this notion of demonization, do, do you think that's more of a issue of rhetoric or like how they're being taxed, I suppose? I don't think it's, it's how they're being taxed because um, I meet with all types of people and they don't mind contributing, paying their fair share. But when they are maybe, you know, you know, on Twitter, for example, and criticized for you know starting a company or employing hundreds of people here and paying you know millions of dollars in taxes, I think that's where it becomes personal to them. But it's not that they don't want to pay taxes; it's when they're singled out for trying to be entrepreneurial and live and stay and have their workers here. Is I think I think so. Would you, you consider Proposition 30, which you know is a tax on millionaires to um, fund um, electric vehicle programs? Is that singling out that's unfair? And have you taken a position on that? I've not taken a public position. 
Uh, but I am very sensitive to the high net worth individuals and $2 million uh, revenue earners is not a lot. Um, also, some of the, uh, you know, the, the revenues that would be generated is going to help Lyft and Uber convert their fleets. Um, that's great, but how about the 99% of us that don't have a garage, right, uh, that want to have an electric vehicle? Like, it's not really going towards us, but more for the people who can afford to ride Lyft and Uber. Um, so, so I mean, that, those sound like a lot of the objections that the governor has raised about that proposition, and yeah. he has publicly come out against it. So why haven't you taken a position? Um, no one's really asked me to take a public position, really, um, or the people that have know that I am not, uh, I am not, you know, pro Prop 30. So, if you want me to take a position, then yes, I will be no on Prop 30. Um, I have a couple more general tax related questions for you. Um, you know, there's been a lot of changes to the economy that I think have had an impact on how the state is deriving its revenue. And there's been ideas that have been floated about changing who pays taxes and, and how. Um, so I do want to ask, do you support any changes you know, to income taxes or sales taxes to account for this shift to, toward a more service-based economy? Um, that would sort of set the state up for a different kind of revenue picture in the future? Yeah, so I served four years on the State Board of Equalization before this job. Um, and so I understand how uh, tax auditors from a tax agency, um, how intrusive uh, sometimes it is, and in times of deficit, they become very, very aggressive. And so I do not support a all-out uh, service um, tax on services because everyone who walks a dog, cuts hair, you know, has a laundromat, all of a sudden is going to have to fill out lots of forms, go through audits, and deal with uh, tax people all year long. So I think um, if there are certain industries, um, like I targeted industries perhaps uh, in terms of services, I know that we uh, looked at taxing the entertainment, you know, for ticket sales, for example. Um, there are certain ones, I think, where it is discretionary for people, that if they're willing to pay for going to a 49ers game or a Lady Gaga concert, um, you know, then, you know, those fees may be already, you know, accounted for in, in the price. But everyday, uh, you know, everyday services is going to impact everyone, and it's going to trickle down uh, to the consumers. So I don't support a full-on sales tax on services. And um, I think I know where your answer will be on this one. But do you support a wealth tax uh, on, you know, upper-income residents uh, who, uh, you know? Or, or, or an increase in tax rates for, for the wealthiest residents. There's been some proposals in, yeah. in the legislature over the last few years. Obviously, haven't gone anywhere, but I don't, I don't know if those ideas have completely gone away. So just curious to get your thoughts on that. Well, there's carrots and there's sticks, right? I like carrots. So, you know, <laughs> if, you can, if you can incentivize people, bring them to the table, listen to their ideas, uh, I think there's compromises that can be had, right? You can increase uh, taxes if you maybe give some sort of incentive, like, okay, if you're going to increase the tax on the wealthy, um, you will give them a tax uh, credit, tax deduction for donating to nonprofits that are serving underserved areas that need the most help, for example. I think ideas like that, people will buy in because they see that there's a nexus and you know you're you're not just you know pounding them with a stick all the time. Uh, and I guess hand in hand with that I should ask, are, are there things that you think the state needs to be raising additional revenue to do? I mean obviously you don't raise taxes just to raise them, but you know, are are there programs that the state is is not tackling, places that should be expanding that, you know, that would, I guess, really be helpful for to have additional revenue? Uh, well, one of my favorite is the fairgrounds. We have 78 fairgrounds in the state of California. 
Um, traditionally, they were for agriculture, but now they are probably the last area of family-friendly, low-cost uh, public community sites. Mm -hmm. So you can have, you know, your quinceañeras, your your birthday parties, but we haven't put in the money to improve the infrastructure mm -hmm. for these properties. Now, during all of the fire, um, you know, the, during the fires, they are used as 911 emergency centers, but the infrastructure still hasn't been improved. And even after all of the 911 responders leave, they don't leave it in a better place necessarily, right? They've done wear and tear, the roads are worse, you know, they, they've parked all over the grass. I mean, so that would be my priority, number one, is to better utilize those fairgrounds um, for not only community uh, projects that help the surrounding community during the fairs. If you ask any community that has a fair, that is their one time where they make a lot of money. People come in, they stay, they, they pay sales taxes, they buy, they eat. Um, and it's, it's really um, you know, a boon for a lot of these smaller towns, especially in the rural areas. So I don't think we've been putting money, uh, enough money into it, uh, trying to upkeep it. And if the state doesn't want to upkeep it, then let's form a joint powers authority with the local government, with the Board of Supervisors or with the city so that they can jointly own and fundraise, right? Because there's a disconnect sometimes that this is a state property and then the local community is frustrated because they can't use it, it's not up to, up to snuff. The fair board members that are appointed are also frustrated because they want to make more money, they want it to be self-sustaining, but they need this authority from the state. And so um, I think there needs to be just more collaboration and cooperation between uh, the state and the local, especially when it comes to property. And one more uh, somewhat tax-related question. Um, there's you know, two ballot measures this year, uh, Proposition 26 and 27, that would legalize sports betting in some capacity either through tribal casinos or online with some potential implication of additional tax revenues for the state. Do you support either of those measures or what are your position on, on, on those two initiatives? Yeah, so I support Proposition 26 and I'm opposed to 27. So okay. I stand with the tribes. My husband's Cherokee. You know, I just stand with Native Americans. So uh, you feel that, I guess, in support of 26, you hope that the tribes have the capacity to be able to offer sports betting at their casinos. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, talking a little bit about uh, pensions, um, how would you reduce the unfunded debts of CalPERS, CalSERS, and uh, local governments? How would I? How would I? Reduce the unfunded. Un unfunded. Okay. So. This is how I explain this issue to people, because if you take the number in its totality, it's a big number. But if you have a home mortgage, if you own a home, right, your mortgage is your unfunded liability. Do you have to pay it today? Or do you have to pay it over 30 years? And that's the way our pension system works as well. As long as we hit the 6.8% in CalPERS, 7% in CalSTRS over the next whatever 100 years, uh, then everyone will be able to, um, to receive their pension. So PEPRA, Governor Jerry Brown did a great job in making the needed reforms. It wasn't easy. I was in the legislature you know, on that committee for uh, a number of years. But he did um, you know, make those PEPRA um, reforms. And today in CalPERS, 46% of the active members are under PEPRA. So they are under the new system where they retire later, they get less. I mean, there's just a lot more. It's not as generous as it was before. So that's what I would say. Right now, um, CalPERS is 73% funded. CalSTRS is like 72% funded. And we look at full funding uh, in about 2046 and, and 2040, based on if we hit those assumed rate of return. Right, that's six rates and, and seven. So I think we're moving in the right direction. Obviously, people are living longer, right? Before they would retire at 55 and you know, life expectancy was 65 maybe, and now they retire at 55 and life expectancy is 95. So we have to deal with that you know, 
growing tsunami and we have to change our investment um, criteria as well. So I know in both pension systems we have put more emphasis and money into private equity because that is the uh, asset allocation that generates uh, greater returns than all the other ones. But we do have a balanced portfolio and we're always tweaking it and looking you know, um, to make sure that we are making those returns. Um, and would you change any other specific investment policies of either of those funds, CalPERS or CalSpace? Uh, I, I don't do the day to day. You know, I'm, I'm just a board member. We have lots of consultants that uh, advise uh, the team. We have internal uh, investment teams at both of the uh, pension funds. So I think th they're hitting the numbers. Um, you know, I think that's the most important, right? If they hit the seven and the six. 0.8%, then I think the board is, is pretty happy, even though this year the returns are down, but you also have to average it over a one-year, three-year, five-year, 10-year, you know, 30-year horizon. So um, this is patient capital. It's not short-term. You know, we don't flip, um, you know, equity at, um, stocks just to make long, uh, short-term gains, but it is really for the long-term, and so we're always tweaking it, the portfolios. Um. Speaking of tweaking it, do you think the state should divest from Russian companies or funds due to uh, the situation in Ukraine? Yes, yes. I was uh, one of the first public officials to uh, request that, and I'm on record asking for divestment from So Russia. what's your sense of why that hasn't really happened yet? Uh, well, I'm also one of the, the ones that stands with these teenagers who come to CalSTRS at every investment meeting and ask us to divest from fossil fuels because they have a legitimate, um, they have a legitimate argument. They say, you're not gonna be here when we have our grandkids and we want our grandkids to have everything that we have today. And I feel very strongly that that is a legitimate argument. And so I do push you know, CalSTRS and CalPERS to, um, to divest or at least invest in those companies that are moving toward green, sustainable, um, you know, uh, processes. So I feel strongly about that. Um, the reason that they don't is because they say that um, as fiduciaries, we should basically trust our investment team um, to make those decisions and that it is better to stay in those assets so we can engage in proxy wars and change the composition of board members, for example, or weigh in on policies. And I hear that, that's legitimate, but we shouldn't, you know, just, it shouldn't just be a, a one, you know, it should be like dual tracks. We should be looking for those companies that are doing the right thing. These days, young people want to work for companies that are doing the right thing, right? Um, they don't want to hear, hey, let's just wait, you know, 30 years and hopefully things will change, right? They say, you know, why, does, why isn't the company doing this? Why aren't they investing like this? Why doesn't the board of directors uh, look like this? Why are the CEOs getting paid billions of dollars, right? I mean, they question everything and so we, I believe as investors have to also think about where the next generation um, wants to go, where they want to work, what companies are going to still be around and viable and profitable. And I think the pension funds only look at short-term profitability versus you know, the long-term um, picture. So have you had any success in persuading other members of those boards to your view? I did. Um, so Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman, has also joined me. So that's two votes? That's two. <laughs> okay. Do you have a, a hope of having a majority of the boards come over to you? Well, CalPER, uh, CalSTRS now has um, basically set more aggressive goals to move toward uh, those clean, sustainable energy um, you know, companies. So they are moving. Um, they're setting their own you know, goal. They're a little bit slower than, than perhaps myself and Tony would like them to, but that's how, you know, that's how government works and politics. You just gotta keep pushing, otherwise it's always gonna be the status quo.
Um, okay. Uh, so I did, uh, did want to ask you um, about uh, some, uh, a couple of issues that have come up during your first term. The first being you were sued by a former employee who accused you of sexual harassment during work trips in which you shared lodging. Um, and I did want to ask if there is anything you can say about the accusations made against you in that lawsuit. Yeah, so we are in the lawsuit uh, currently. It's ongoing, um, but it is a frivolous lawsuit against a former uh, disgruntled employee who was released for performance. That's all I can say. I have a very small agency of about 420 people. Everybody needs to perform. And when they're not performing uh, up to par, uh, then we have to move on to make sure that um, we get people who can perform. Do you, do you deny all of the allegations of sexual harassment and discrimination in, in the lawsuit? I look forward to my day in court. OK. Uh, related to that, the Sacramento Bee reported that you were the only statewide official to expense all of your lodging during your trips to Sacramento during those first few years of your term and you know during those trips you often shared that lodging with staff are you continuing with that policy or have you changed that your approach to your lodging and sharing lodging with staff members as a result of this lawsuit um, I drive back and forth from the office every day Whenever I come to Sacramento. Okay, yeah. so so you no longer are, are staying in Sacramento overnight anymore? Uh, no, but during COVID, I was here every day for six months, Monday through Friday, from 8 a.m. to 6, 6 p.m. working. So, I mean, as a result of, of, these, of this lawsuit, have, have you changed your a policy about sharing lodging with subordinates? Yes. Okay, so you're no longer doing that? No. Um, I also wanted to ask about uh, this issue with Blue Flame that came up. It was obviously caught by banks before the money was wired over, but that did, you know, come after your office approved the deal. So have there been any lessons that you learned from that experience about your approach to contracts and, and your oversight of them or anything like that? Yeah, so I um, testified in, in front of the legislature, um, number one, when the request comes to me to do a wire transfer, I am the last person. And my job is not to vet all of the contracts. It starts at the Department of General Services, it goes to the Department of Finance, it goes to uh, the controller's office, and they are the sign-off authority. Then when it comes to me, it's like when you come to the bank and you want your check cashed, I don't ask you, where are you living? Do you have a job? I mean, I assume you bring a check. That check is, is good tender and I cash your check. However, since then, I have had to vet or I've taken upon myself and my office to vet every new warrant and uh, wire transfer that was requested of us during the COVID uh, pandemic. And so that's what I did in addition to what I'm required to do. But every new vendor, we made sure, you know, did we do background check on them? Do they have an office here in California? Are they in compliant, compliance with all of the filings? I mean, we did actually do more due diligence. So that was a lesson learned, but. So there's new, new policies in place in your office as, as a result of that? Or I guess well, a new there's process, a, there's I should a say. Pro yes. So in my office, we requires we require everything to be signed off. And when that blue flame um, request came, it was not it was not everything was not checked off in terms of all of the processes and procedures. And so we sent it back to all of the different uh, folks in the routing and ask them to come back and make sure that they sign off on everything before we were able to, you know, even process the wire transfer. I understand. I guess I'm just trying to, I, I'm wondering about, you know, it, it sounds like for 
moving forward from that experience that you have a new process to try and ensure that a situation like that does not happen again? Yes, we're very um, diligent in terms of you know, who the vendors are, especially if they're new vendors, and we will do additional um, research on new vendors, just to double check. Okay. Um, there was a piece of legislation that you helped develop that um, to allow the uh, the leader of the Santa Ana Police Union to get uh, to boost his salary for the purposes of pen his public pension by including his salary from his union work in addition to his police work. And um, I was wondering why you got involved in that particular issue. Yeah, so um, as a CalPERS member, CalSTRS, many constituents come and ask us um, for clarification or helping uh, navigate the system, getting through the red tape. So in this situation um, with uh, that gentleman, he had signed a MOU with his uh, city and himself. And it was fairly um, negotiated. It was the same agreement that other uh, POA presidents had signed in the past. Prior POA presidents did not have some of their, you know, their, um, their special extra uh, credentials uh, removed. And so it was actually the city of Santa Ana that also wanted to make sure that everything was copacetic so that he could retire. So he had taken the job, signed an MOU, moved forward knowing that he was going to do this job for four or five years. And the city actually and him came to us and said, we want to make sure everything is fine. Uh, then he um, called a vote of, uh, of no confidence on the police chief. And that's when the city then turned and filed a whistleblower complaint saying that they no longer supported that MOU agreement that was signed. So the amendment that we worked on was trying to allow CalPERS to review these MOUs before people retire. Like when people are going to sign an MOU, CalPERS would be available to go through it and approve of it so we don't have these problems five or six years down the road. Because it's costly. It's lawsuits now. And so that's the amendment that we worked on that did get into um, a bill. But I did see reporting from some of some local outlets down in Orange County that show that there was communication between your office and you know, this union leader and that this effort was developed in conjunction with him. I mean, is it appropriate for, is it appropriate role for a treasurer to be involved in so specific of an issue to benefit one person when you've obviously got these other big statewide issues that you're working on? Well, I don't think it's just one person. There's other people that also are in that similar situation. So I like to try to fix problems. I was in the legislature as a majority whip and speaker pro tem for six years, um, sponsored and got 60 bills signed by two different governors. And I still, to this day, sponsor legislation. Um, you know, dozen legislation that affects my office. We provide technical support. And I'm still involved with policy issues uh, that I care about as you know, part of the Legislative Women's Caucus. So I am still actively involved in the legislative process. And when I see something that needs to be fixed, um, moving forward, that is good for the state of California, good for the people, that saves money in the long term, um, you know, I, I, I will engage. Um, so before we wrap up, um, we did want to give you the opportunity to speak directly to the voters who will be watching this and um, just tell them why you're a better choice um, on November 8th than, um, than your opponent. Okay, um, Fiona Ma, California State Treasurer. Uh, I served on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors for four years, State Assembly for six years, uh, State Board of Equalization for four years, and now I'm finishing my fourth year as State Treasurer. Um, I have been around, I have seen a lot, done a lot, uh, know a lot, and as your State Treasurer, as your banker, last year $3.2 trillion came into my office. I manage a short-term portfolio of about $228 billion. I issue all the bonds for the state of California and the UC system. And we have uh, saved 
taxpayers over $5 billion over the next 10 to 20 years uh, by refunding bonds. We have uh, invested in short-term liquid investments um, to make sure that we're getting the best rates that we can on our uh, short-term investments. And I also chair 13 boards, commissions, and authorities that funds and finances affordable housing, schools, hospitals, public transportation, green energy, um, advanced manufacturing, and I oversee three savings programs. I chair all of my committees. Um, I am uh, very intimately engaged in all of the policy issues, all the programs. We have been very successful in creating new programs, especially during the pandemic, to be proactive uh, in case we were going to face uh, cash flow um, issues, so setting up different lines of credit for schools and for hospitals uh, and the like. Um, I'm very comfortable with numbers. I am a certified public accountant. I specialize in real estate taxation since uh, 1992. I have my bachelor's in accounting, my master's in taxation, and an MBA in finance. So I'm very honored to be here as your treasurer. I take my job very, very seriously, and I work very closely with the other constitutional officers as well as the legislature uh, to make sure that I am um, fulfilling uh, the uh, will of the legislature and the voters and making sure that I am doing it in a very transparent and accountable and efficient manner. So as your state banker, I hope that you will elect me for another four years. Okay. Thank you very much for coming in. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah.